Hey there. So the podcast is currently on an extended hiatus so that I can write my next book and work on some other exciting projects. But while we're away, I hope you'll enjoy this fan favorite episode from the archives. If you want brand new content to help you make peace with food and heal from diet culture, come sign up for my free weekly newsletter at christyharrison.com slash newsletter, where I answer a weekly listener question. And as always, if you join my Intuitive Eating Fundamentals course at christyharrison.com slash course, you get access to our exclusive monthly Q&A podcast where I answer all your new questions. Just go to christyharrison.com slash newsletter and christyharrison.com slash course to sign up or click the links in the episode description. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author of the book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating, which is available wherever books are sold. Join me here every week as I interview interesting people from all different backgrounds about their paths toward peace with food in their bodies. And by the way, on this show, we bleep out diet culture stuff like weight and calorie numbers, but we don't censor swear words or other adult language, so listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to episode 250 of Food Psych, our season eight premiere. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Brianna Campos, a fat positive, health at every size therapist and body image coach, and a lovely human to kick off this eighth year of the podcast. We talked about how to improve body image and fight internalized weight stigma, her concept of body grief how body image is connected to what's going on in the world around you, and so much more. I can't wait to share our conversation with you in just a moment. But first, it's time for Ask Food Psych, our listener Q&A segment. This week, I have an amazing answer for you from a fabulous co-host and friend of the pod, Savala Trepchinsky. Savala shared her story in episode 191, so if you haven't heard that interview already, I highly recommend checking it out. She's a badass writer, teacher, and social justice attorney with a book coming out next year, and I just love her. And before I play Savala's answer, I'll just give our standard disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only, aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice, and don't constitute a provider-patient relationship. So this week's question is from a listener named Amy who writes, Hi, I'm a 42-year-old married mother of five kids. When I was younger, I struggled with an eating disorder, and while I have mostly recovered, I still struggle at times. Intuitive eating was literally life-changing for me and has helped so much in my recovery. However, I'm confused about how to implement some of the strategies with a large family. I know that for my own recovery, a big part of rejecting diet culture was making certain trigger foods always available, so those foods did not bring up feelings of restriction and then subsequent disordered eating behavior. However, I'm noticing that within my own family, when we do have special foods, such as those found during holidays or parties in the house, the entire family seems to have this scarcity mindset and consumes those foods at a higher rate simply because they're thinking, better eat it now before it's gone, which is totally true. With so many people in our household, special foods do not last long at all. I really want to help my children avoid disordered eating, but it is simply not practical, nor within our budget, to keep those more desirable foods always available. Our family is well-fed and there is always plenty to eat in the house, but when special occasions arise and we have special foods, I feel like the better eat it now before it's gone slash scarcity mindset starts to kick in. What do you suggest? How can I help my family avoid a scarcity mindset with special foods when just by virtue of budgetary limits and the number of people living in our house, those special foods are more scarce? Thank you. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that question, Zavala. Well, I love this question. I relate to it and to the listener who wrote it so much. 
I too am a mom. Um, I only have one kid, not five. So, you know, we're in different boats in that way, but I too am a mom and have a background of the listener says an eating disorder in her case. I always say disordered eating and mine because I never had a diagnosis, even though the whole concept of how these things are diagnosed can be problematic. Since I never had one, I just say I had a disordered eating background and a part of my recovery that was incredibly important, like the listener writes, is, you know, making these quote unquote um, forbidden foods available and trying to make them just a normal kind of low key part of how food flows through my life so that I don't set myself up for the kind of restriction binge cycle and also because I I really enjoy food. And so part of, you know, my recovery was just, was and is about making these foods that I love and sort of limited just available so that I can enjoy them, right? Just for the sake of the pleasure of enjoying them. So I relate to this question on so many levels. And first and foremost, I think I approach it as a mom And as a former kid dieter, we don't know when this person started their eating disorder and their their dieting, but I started when I was very, very young. And so as a mom of now a five-year-old, one of my main goals really in life as a mom is to raise a child who trusts her appetite, who trusts her behavior around food and who can eat without a lot of drama and a lot of sort of negative emotional stuff happening at the same time. So I think that that's a goal that this mom shares. I think that's kind of underlying the question is, you know, how do I help my family have a relationship with food that is pleasurable and not marked by a ton of drama, you know, given her background and given just the reality of of their budget and, um, you know, how they put food on the table. So here's how I kind of handle that in my own life as a mom and in terms of feeding my own family, since I'm the person who's in charge of cooking and putting food on the table in my house. This very much, you know, falls into my domain. So the first thing that I do and that I would invite this mom to do or encourage her to do and maybe to model um, for her kids and for the other people in the family is just accepting that the scarcity mindset Like it's a thing that probably is not going anywhere. It's part of our human experience around food and um, around all sorts of things. You know, I happen to think that it's, it's mostly drilled into us so that we become like good little shoppers who will go out and participate in the economy in our capitalist society. But if you don't want to get political about it, you know, that's, that's fine too. We just, are told in all kinds of ways that there's not enough and more or different would make life better, right? So that's just a part of of how we are as a culture. And I think that if you can kind of accept that some sense of scarcity is unavoidable and you can just sort of depathologize a little bit the presence of that sense of scarcity, then just that in and of itself is kind of relaxing and can help you um, not be so reactive to it. Because what I have learned and what I learn over and over again, this is an ongoing process, is that my reaction to what I'm feeling is often what actually is causing my discomfort, right? It's not the fact that I am excited about brownies and want to have more brownies. It's the fact that I freak out about that excitement that causes me, you know, to have pain and to have drama and trauma around eating. So the first thing I would say for this mom is maybe just try to relax about the fact that there's a scarcity mindset around holiday special foods, just a little, a little bit of relaxation and see if that helps her kind of 
welcome it because I think when you welcome it, it's easier to deal with it than if you're resisting it. She talks about holidays in particular and special food that might come up at special times of year. And I think it's actually okay to kind of lean into the excitement that people have about these special treats that maybe happen, you know, at Halloween or at Christmas. I don't know what holidays they celebrate, but or at birthdays, you know, there's a certain kind of childlike joy about seeing a birthday cake, for example, or a huge bag of candy. And if she can just sort of accept that there's a sort of a natural excitement about delicious food that you don't have that often. Um, She doesn't have to be so scared of what she sees her family feeling, you know? So in my house, I'm sort of, I might not say this out loud, but I'm kind of thinking to myself like, yeah, it's true that this birthday cake is just for today and everybody wants to eat a bunch of it. I want to eat a bunch of it. It's delicious. You know, I'm going to have, a big slice because it's a treat. Maybe I'm going to have more than one slice because it is a treat and I'm excited and I want to get as much of the street as I can. Tomorrow's not a birthday, so we won't have a birthday cake, you know, and it's okay to be really excited about the smell and the texture and the sight and the celebration that accompany the street. And it's okay to try and kind of, you know, maximize my enjoyment of the whole experience which includes the food. It's not that the excitement for the cake is the issue. It's like the fear of what that excitement is sing- signaling. She might be afraid that seeing her kids, you know, kind of really want the cake or like scramble for the birthday cake means that they're going to eat too much junk food. Or she might be afraid her kids will grow up to be fat, which is a word I use as a descriptor without a value attachment to it. She might be afraid that her family's already kind of steeped in diet culture and experiencing restriction and that somehow she has failed or not done a good job as a mom. So it's like the scarcity itself can be almost more of a neutral thing. It's what's under it, how we're reacting to it, that is probably more important than the scarcity itself. I think The other reason that noticing scarcity can be frightening is if it makes you feel like you're never going to get any more, right? (laughs) So scarcity mindset in a pattern of deprivation or in a house where overall there's emotional or physical restriction and deprivation around food is a little bit different than what I think this person is talking about. I think she's describing a house where there is an abundance of food, but that treats, particular kinds of treats like holiday treats are special. So that's really important, right? This idea of relaxing about scarcity kind of requires that scarcity isn't the norm. That's such a beautiful way to frame it too, because it really is such a different feeling. And I wonder like, you know, for in your experience, and I know I've had a number of clients who've who've gone through this too, where like it shifts, right? The ability to see something as scarce might feel terrifying at first when you are in a context of overall scarcity and deprivation. And then down the line, when you have been able to heal from that scarcity and deprivation, seeing something as, you know, just for one day only, or this, you know, it's it's happening for this occasion. And then once it's gone, we're not going to have it until next year. That doesn't carry that same sort of negative emotional charge. It actually is, it can be more fun, can be more exciting, you know, and and holds that special quality without feeling like it's just more deprivation, more of the same. So I'm curious if you had any sort of experience in your own life of transitioning from things being scarce and having a lot of deprivation overall and feeling like this sadness or difficulty around certain foods being for special occasions. And if that shifted for you once the the overall deprivation changed. Yeah, it definitely did. I mean, it ebbs and flows. I, when I have these kind of conversations, I always have to say, I'm not cured. You know, I'm just practicing a more liberated way of being in my body and being with my body and with food. So it does ebb and flow. Like when I'm super stressed out, 
I, I feel more scarcity and I feel more panicked about the scarcity and what does it mean, you know, but overall as, you know, slowly over time, over years, I relearned to trust myself with food and that I, I just was never, ever going to diet or restrict again. As I said that to myself again and again and again, and sort of practiced it in a million little ways, it just became less, I don't want to say food became less powerful because I feel like that's something that you hear in like a lot of dieting circles. It is nevertheless true, although I mean it in a really different way than how someone steeped in diet culture or selling a diet might say it. The reason it became less powerful is not because I had sort of bullied myself into never thinking about it so I could be on my diet. It became less powerful because I stopped doing that. And, you know, I always had some form of cookie or ice cream or whatever in my house. And so over time, I just learned that these things were part of my daily life, whether I chose to eat them or not might vary from day to day, but they were always available to me. And I brought that kind of always available, you know, tool or lesson kind of into how I feed my family. And this kind of gets back to, to her question in terms of relaxing about scarcity is going to work best if the overall pattern in her family is one where there are treats that are dependable, right? And where there isn't a lot of restriction. And in my family, you know, I sort of knew that and I was like, okay, so we need to have dependable treats so that we normalize treats and so that we can all trust that we're going to get a treat. You know, treats are good. Treats are lovely. They're an important part of life. And I want everyone in my house to know that they're going to get a treat. But I, I struggled with what that meant. Like, okay, so do we get a treat every week? Do we get one after every meal? <laughs> like, do we get one whenever we want? And, you know, what is a treat? Is a treat an ice cream sundae? Is a treat a strawberry? Like, so I, in order to sort of free myself from like the tyranny of indecision and constantly trying to manage, you know, what it meant to, to make treats dependable about a year ago, I just decided that I was going to like free myself from the guesswork and serve dessert every single day. So every single day, every single night we have dessert and I define dessert as something sweet. And some days we have ice cream, some days we have fruit, some days we have, you know, cake. It, it varies. Some days we have candy. It's the only requirement is that it's sweet and it happens every day. That might not be what, you know, works for everyone or what a nutritionist, even like a health at every size registered dietitian, you know, that might not be what they say, but. I love it. (laughs) This one (laughs) says that's great. (laughs) But it's, it's, it's what I've come up with as a way to normalize treats and to let my family know that they can depend on treats every day if they want them. And, you know, maybe more than anything else to let my daughter know that it's okay to be into treats and be excited about them. And she can trust herself around treats, right? Like if I didn't trust her around them, I wouldn't, put them on the table every day. And I want her to have the message that I trust her appetites. And so she can as well. This means if she wants seconds, I let her have them. And again, might not be for everyone. My goal is for my daughter to have the experience of trusting her appetite and following her appetite and experiencing her appetite as being multifaceted. So there are emotional aspects to an appetite. You know, there are visual aspects. There are physical aspects. Sometimes she wants another scoop of ice cream, but she doesn't finish it, you know? So like, I don't, it wasn't physically that she wanted it. She wanted the experience of scooping it or seeing it in the bowl or, you know, I don't know exactly what, but I want her to be able to 
have that experience of her appetite. And I usually don't do more than a couple servings, but you know, if she asks for more, I try to say no in a way that still validates her desire and, you know, keeps it really simple and drama free. You know, like I might say, oh, that ice cream is put away, but oh my God, it was so good. You know, sometimes I want more too. And that could be our dessert tomorrow night if you want. So it's just like keeping it, keeping it simple, keeping it low drama. Sometimes there is drama, you know, but I, I try to manage it on my own on the inside and not kind of put it on the table for her to have to manage with her little five-year-old brain. So that means, you know, I might watch her cutting an additional slice of a brownie or taking additional scoops of the fruit salad. And I'm kind of like, oh, you know, I just have to tell myself like, just breathe, you know, like she's responsible for what she's putting on her plate right now and she can do it, you know, but I will feel my own surge of fear or I'm like, oh gosh, you know, is she taking too much, whatever that means of the food? And is she therefore going to become fill in the blank? It's like my internalized worries that are not really about nutrition because like the mom in this question, you know, there's, there's plenty of food and a variety of food to eat. So it's not really about like, is she getting enough vegetables? It's it's sort of like diet culture that's still in my head. So when I, when I feel it, I just try to say like, Oh, hi, thanks for sharing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to listen to you and just like take a deep breath and and let it go. And I think that this mom can probably do a similar thing. You know, she's a lot of what she's seeing in her family. She probably could kind of scratch below the surface of that on the inside in her own mind and heart and discover what she's fearing all of that means and probably kind of address it on the inside and not sort of transfer it out onto the table. I'm not saying she's doing that. I don't think she's doing that, but she can probably sort of unpack it on the inside and like pull some of the power away from the fear that she has around what she sees with her family. The feelings are real, right? The feelings that the stakes are very, very high, but you can kind of remind yourself that the stakes are not that high if you remind yourself that you can handle it. And for me, that has included kind of modeling for my kid or intentionally setting up situations um, where my kid sees that I think she can handle it. Some of the other things that I will do for having a group of people, you know, so it's like a family party or, or whatever. So there's m- many servings need to be had from the one dessert. I might bring it out at the beginning of the meal, you know, and I'm sort of communicating like, this is something to enjoy. This is beautiful. Like we can all look at it. We can all wait to eat it. You know, we can handle the weight if that's part of, part of the situation. Sometimes I will leave the dessert on the table and then leave the room, (laughs) which maybe sounds incredibly minor, but again, my goal is to communicate to my kid that I trust her around food and she can trust herself. So if when I come back in the room, she's getting an additional serving, that's fine. You know, it's no big deal. Your daughter is so lucky to have you. And this is a brilliant answer. Oh, Christy, thank you. I wanted to just touch really briefly on the idea of abundance and regular treats and the fact that this listener said that it's not within their family budget to have regular treats because I do not want it to seem like I am calling for her to somehow find a way to put dessert on the table every night. You know, if that's, if that's not in her budget, it's not in her budget. You know, I do think part of why I define dessert as something sweet is so it can be, it doesn't have to be extravagant, you know, and I I can sort of use whatever's in the house that has a sweet flavor to accomplish this practice. But I just, I want to 
I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, of course, budget can be a very real issue and can put a constraint on what it looks like to have dependable treats in a house, right? So I just want to acknowledge that the money thing is real. And I think that you can still find your footing and find your freedom in this as a mom who's putting food on the table um, without having to spend a lot of money or frankly time in the kitchen, like coming up with dessert. I guess the last thing I would just add kind of on that same note is being a mom is super tough and she is working hard to give her family an experience of food that she did not have. And that is so complicated and you're sort of swimming upstream culturally in so many ways. So I just want to acknowledge that, you know, she's doing something that is truly a labor of love and that I hope she's not holding herself to a standard of perfection. You know, if there's anything that I've, I've learned, although I, I do have to relearn it, you know, over the course of my several years since I stopped dieting, it's that recovery is about practice and it's about the overall pattern of my thoughts and my actions. And it's okay to have a thought or an action here or there, sometimes frequently, depending on how stressed I am, that don't totally align with my diet culture dropout values. It's not about batting a thousand. It's about sort of the long view and practicing what I want for myself and my family, not always getting it exactly right. No such thing as perfection, just doing the best we can. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much, Savala, for this amazing, insightful, thoughtful answer. I really appreciate it. And can you tell people where they can find you and learn more about you and your work online? Absolutely. And thank you, Christy. It's always a pleasure to chat with you and hang out with you and to just be a part of the amazing work you're doing in the world. And if folks want to see more about my work, they can go to my website, which is savalat.com, or they can find me on Instagram at not quite Beyonce, as in I'm almost, but not quite Beyonce. <laughs> I love it. You so are. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, to me, you're better than Beyonce because oh, you're up. someone I know and love in real life. And <laughs> Beyonce is, you know, a, a faraway dream. So <laughs> indeed. We're well, right back at you, my friend. Aww. Right back at you. Thank you. So thanks again to Savala Tripchinsky for that awesome answer. And thanks so much to Amy for asking the question. To submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, either by me or by one of my occasional Ask Food Site co-hosts, you can go to christyharrison.com slash questions and enter your question there. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then if you want to ask me any question you want and have me answer it much more quickly than I can here, you can come join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. The course has a monthly Q&A podcast that I do just for course participants where you get to ask your own questions and have me answer them individually, and you get to listen to hundreds of answers I've given to other participants already so that you can work through all the nuances and sticking points of intuitive eating and really start to put it into practice in your own life. The course also has 13 modules of audio and written content teaching you the principles of intuitive eating, plus a private community forum just for course participants so that you can connect with other people who are on this path and have daily support from me and my team as well as everyone else in the course. One of those great folks is a participant named Grace who finished the course not too long ago and had this to say about it. She said, I feel more self-love and worth than I have in a long time because of this course. I've been able to practice the intuitive eating fundamentals I just didn't feel confident or have the skills to do prior to this course, despite all the reading I had done. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for the gift of this course. I now feel confident in my ability to continue my intuitive eating journey. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim the life it stole from you, you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. 
That's christyharrison.com slash course. This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by Thread Up. The seasons are changing, and so now is probably a good time to take inventory on your closet. For all of those styles and pieces that you realize you're missing, turn to Thread Up, where you'll find a vast selection of styles and sizes, including plus sizes, plus low prices and convenience. You can also sell nice stuff you don't wear anymore to make room for new pieces, which is really great. And I just did that with ThreadUp, and I made like 60 bucks in store credit. And that goes a long way when the prices on the site are so, so low. Get the styles you love at a fraction of the price. You'll look and feel good with ThreadUp. And for Food Psych listeners, here's an exclusive offer just for you. Get an extra 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash foodpsych. That's T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H for 30% off your first order. Threadup.com slash food psych for an extra 30% off today. Terms apply. And now, without any further ado, let's go to my conversation with Brianna Campos. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Oh, Christy, as uh, somebody who has heard you ask this question so many times, and I can't believe you're asking it to me, I, I feel like if I could pick one word to describe my relationship with food growing up, it would be complicated. And the reason I use the word complicated is for a couple of reasons is because I grew up Italian and my dad is Latino. And so those are cultures where we very much we we love food, but especially in you know an Italian American family, we hate that we love food, right? So there's this love that we love food, and food is used for celebration and culture and gatherings. But at the same time, there was also this you know like oh we shouldn't be eating you know certain foods, and there were, were certain foods that were demonized and were bad. And I'd also say that because I grew up, I, you know, and I, I always say this, I always grew up in a larger body, but you know, now that I look at pictures, I wasn't really that large. I mean, I, I remember distinctly being larger than my peers and my brother, but not that much larger. But I, I remember there were separate rules for me and other people. So for example, And then I always put this disclaimer in whenever I talk about my parents, I believe that they did the best they can with the resources they had available to them. And like, I'll I'll remember if I saw somebody eating, you know, a dessert and I'd be like, oh, that looks good. Can I have some? I would get asked, well, do you, do you want that because I'm eating it or because you're hungry? And I I would be like, "Uh, I don't know. (laughs) And, 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 or, or if I wanted seconds and I, I remember there were specifically different rules for, for my, my brother who quote unquote was a growing boy. So he could go back for seconds or third. But if I would go back for seconds, it would be like, well, why don't you have a piece of fruit or are you really hungry? And so my, my relationship with food was, was pretty complicated because I, I loved food, but I also was afraid to love food because I was taught to question, you know, you know, my hunger and like there were separate rules for, for, because, and I believed starting at a really young age because of my body size. God, that's so painful. And it's so interesting too, how that parallels with like the dietized version of intuitive eating where it's like, are you really hungry or do you just want that? You know, like, uh, what a recipe to take you away from true intuitive eating. Right. And, and and I I mean again, I really do believe that, you know, my family did the best that they could, but I I know that there was there was a fear because, you know, there are people in my family in larger bodies that of course it came down to the only reason I possibly could be in a larger body would be because I'm eating too much, which so growing up, I did a lot of these like diet programs and a lot of these like overeaters groups and emotional eater groups. And I remember I would sit there and be like, yeah, like I don't resonate with any of this. Like I never felt like I was, I would never like hid food or, you know, closet ate food. Like I would see, I won't say who, but someone in my family who would stress eat. And I, I never resonated with that yet. My plate was being monitored and my plate was being portioned. And so I, I remember feeling shame. And, and so one of the, you know, the first examples that I'll talk about correlating like the shame with my food with my body was going to the doctors. I was eight years old. And I remember 
I can't remember if I was naked, like, because it was a physical, but I remember feeling naked. So not that it matters, but I remember feeling naked. And the doctor, she was, she had a very strong accent. And she just, you know, said to me, you're too fat. Like, this is where you're supposed to be. And then this is all the way where you are. And she she looked at my mom and that's what she said to her. And then she looked at me and said, you know, you need to eat fruits and vegetables and exercise and not reward yourself with dessert. Never once asking me, what do you eat? What does your you know, daily intake of food look like? She didn't know I was on the soccer team and the dance team and, and a theater team. Like, she didn't realize that that movement was a big part of my life. And so that was like one of the first moments where I realized that my body was bad and food made my body bad. Mm, God, that is so upsetting. <sighs> such a clear example of how fat phobia gets into the medical system too and at such a young age. And by making these assumptions about what you did and didn't do, what you ate and didn't ate, you know, she completely negated your humanity. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I remember the first time, like I told that story and it was, I was so like distant from it. And now I think about eight-year-olds, I, I work with eight-year-olds and I could cry thinking about, oh my God, you were eight years old when that mm -hmm. happened. Like, and, and the way I would relate it to people is like, what are eight-year-olds into? Let's see. I mean, uh, what grade are you in when you're eight? You're like, what, second grade? And I think I was probably into like Pokemon and because I wanted to keep up with my brother and I liked Barbies and I liked, you know, hanging out with my friends and I like music. I had no concept of my body until I was brought attention to it and was brought attention that I had somehow had control over it. And I'll never forget that night when I came home from, from the doctors, I remember being in my bathtub and just being in my body. And I'll never forget this. I remember praying that God would do two things. I prayed that he would make me thin and that he would clean my room. And he did not serve those two. <laughs> But I remember just being so sad that I was like, man, I I just, I want to show her that I can do this. And being somebody who's a people pleaser, it started this really tumultuous journey of trying to prove to my doctors and to the world that I can do this. Yeah, of course. I can imagine like... It's an authority figure, you're a kid, it's, you know, when you're eight years old, my God, yeah, like that magical thinking of praying to God to clean your room, I feel like just <laughs> shows kind of what the vulnerable stage you're at, actually, at that age, you know? And oh, God, so that must have really been, yeah, such a painful start to your journey and your relationship with food. How did it unfold from there? What did you end up doing with that? information or that sort of feeling like you should be changing your body. Yeah. So after that it was probably the first time that I went on like a formalized diet per se. And it probably wasn't until I was about, I don't know, like 12 years old that I started to realize there's a very different we had a different set of rules for when we were dieting to when we were not. So whenever I was dieting, you know, a member of my family would do it with me. And then when we'd stop dieting, we would stop together. And, and like when I was dieting, like we would, you know, obviously eat like a lot of vegetables or there would be a lot of this and there would be less of this. And, and then when we go off the diet, it would be like, ah, you know, we can, you know, whatever, we're not, we're not going to, you know, eat these other foods. And, and, and like, as I think about it too, I would say my mom did a really good job. Like when she would make dinner, there was always a variety of different foods right? So there was a normalization for me of foods. And, I, and as I'm thinking about it, I was far less picky than my, my brother was. My brother, my brother, when it came to food, like he didn't like certain foods to touch. He didn't like vegetables and he was in a thin body. And so it was never, his health was never questioned in the same way mine was. And I actually, you know, as an adult, I still like vegetables. And so as I got older, I realized, you know, it's like, it's so interesting that, you know, when I'm dieting, you know, I eat plain celery. <laughs> and when I'm not dieting, I don't do that. And so I did a lot. I, I mean, any diet, you can think of, I have done like every single day. And, and I, I forgot somebody said to me, well, maybe you're not doing it long enough. No, bullshit. I have done every diet to the like best of my ability. My mom's favorite story to tell about me 
is when I was four years old, I wanted to learn how to tie my shoes because I was in like a, a like a group of kids who could already tie their shoes. So I was like, I'm going to learn how to tie my shoes. And I just sat there and I, I just did it until I could tie them. And I would say that is the same tenacity and and energy that I put towards dieting. When I did it, I did it a hundred percent and I would do it. And I would, there would be this pride that I would have. And I thrived on the compliments from people about my willpower, right. And my hard work and my dedication. And they'd be like, wow, I can't, I could never do that. I can't believe you're doing. And I, I lived for those moments or when people would compliment my body and be like, yes, it's working. And then I'd get to a point where I would plateau and I would be so frustrated. I'd be like, why am I even doing this if it's not working? And that basically describes my entire life while dieting. And, and each time I would diet, the plateau would be like I would push past, like, so let's say it was a month, then it would be three months, six months, or whatever. Each time I died it, I would plateau longer and I would be like, no, I'm going to hold out. And then eventually I'd break and I'd be like, fuck this, not doing this anymore. And I'd go off the diet. And, and every, that was my response, which is like, I'd be like, I don't even give a fuck, right? Like, I just, I don't care. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And then the cycle would repeat when I saw a picture of myself or when I would want to do an activity that I feel like my body was, was preventing me from doing, or, you know, whatever the case may be that I would get into this, like, you know, okay, well, I'm going to diet and it's, it's really going to work this time. And I would get this high of like, like, I'm going to, I have found this new thing that I, like there's science behind it. There's picture proof of other people doing it. I'm finally going to do it. And I laugh now because it's, it's sad because yeah, I really believed it. And of course you don't go into a diet thinking this is going to fail, right? You go in thinking it's going to be different this time. I went to a weight loss camp. I've done everything. And when I was 19 years old, I decided that I was going to get weight loss surgery. And I as I say it out loud, it's so, I can't believe that at 19 years old, they let me get weight loss surgery, but I digress. <laughs> that is so young. I mean, barely an adult. And what was the procedure like for getting clear to get weight loss surgery? Like, did you have to jump through a bunch of hoops or was it pretty easy to sail through? Well, so I had had a family member who had gotten the bypass and I saw the success that they had with it. And so I was like, I want that. I want the success. I want to be able to do it. And then at the same time, I also felt like shame because I was like, oh, well, I'm just cheating. Right. And it was so heartbreaking that that would even cross my mind. And so, so I started looking into the surgery when I was still in high school. I was 17, I think, when I started looking into it. And (laughs) no doctor would do the bypass surgery. So if people aren't familiar, they, they have the, the, at the time they did the bypass, which is where they like staple your stomach and they like, I don't know, rewire it. And then they have, they had the lap band, which is where they put a band around your, your stomach, which essentially is supposed to stop you from eating too much, which is ridiculous because whatever I digress. So, so I wanted the the bypass and no doctor would do a bypass surgery on a 17 year old, but then I was approved. It took about two years for me to get approved for the lap band. And I remember thinking like, but that's not what I wanted. And when you looked at the quote unquote outcomes of the bypass versus the, the lap band, I remember thinking, I still want the, I still want the bypass and I'll never forget my doctor being like, well, we'll try the bypass, the lap band. And if it doesn't work, we can do the bypass later on. (laughs) Two major surgeries, tens of thousands of dollars. (laughs) Like what? (laughs) So so yeah, I got that done when I was in college and it worked as much as it was supposed to. I I think like the statistic is you lose what, like percent of your weight. I don't know, but I didn't know that going in. Like I really thought it was going to be like this transformation. And so I, 
I'll, I'll never forget thinking in my mind, like, this is it. This is going to change everything. I am going to feel different once I get to that weight. And I remember that my weight loss was really slow. And I, I'll never forget. I went to the doctor and I was the lowest weight and I was like, well, it's actually like, I was pretty impressed with myself. And he said, well, it's going in the right direction. It's just not where I want it to be. And the way the lap band works is so they put a band around your stomach and they would inject saline into, to the band, which makes it inflatable, I guess. Yeah, it tightens it around the stomach so that there's less stomach capacity. Exactly. Thank you. So he filled it up so much that I couldn't even drink water. So I would take a sip of water. And if you imagine like, you know, like a Brita filter where the water just kind of like drips down, that's what my life was like for about a week. And anytime I tried to eat, I was in severe pain. And on the way at college, And I remember calling my mom and being like, I don't know what to do. And she was like, you need to call the doctor and you need to go back. So I had to go back in for an emergency. Like I had to go to the hospital and they had to like take out the the saline and he took all the saline out. And he's like, well, I guess I put too much in. He's like, so I emptied it. You're going to come back next week and we're going to refill it. I never went back. (laughs) because it was such a traumatic experience. And for anybody that's had weight loss surgery, even though I didn't, I never felt like I resonated with being a quote unquote emotional eater or an overeater. I mean, obviously under restriction I did, but when your food, like when you're like, wow, this is what I want to eat. And then you are limited. Like you cannot eat. It is, it, it is the most I can't even like a humiliating experience ever. And it's frustrating because you're like, I know this is what my body's supposed to do and I can't do it. It's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. And so, you know, I really found myself when I was in college and, and I, I really attribute, you know, the fact that I never developed an eating disorder, partly because I think I had, you know, safe attachments growing up, also never having, not having the predisposition. But when you look, when I look at eating disorder criteria, I uh, like that perfectionist tendency, the desire to be thin, like all of that was there. So I still struggle with the fact that I never developed an eating disorder, but I really, I was my, I had things in my life that gave me purpose and value outside of my body. And my body was just like this thing over here that I just didn't connect to. I was like, I'm just not going to deal with that. I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to just, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to connect to it. And then it would just kind of sneak its way in, but I was still able to have friends. I was still able to, you know, be active on my campus and it didn't, it didn't control my life. It was just sort of like, um, like a rock in my shoe. And so then they're like, then this thing would like sneak in and be like, oh yeah, you're also fat. And, and this is going to stop you from being successful in your future, or this is going to stop you from getting a boyfriend. So from there, okay, so this now we're, I'm ready to graduate college. And, and this is the first time I'll be sharing this publicly on, on a, like a podcast like this. So in 2012, my older brother died. He passed away from a drug overdose. Mm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So it'll be, it'll be eight years. Uh, this is being recorded in May. So this is, it'll be, it'll be eight years this month. And I remember, I remember feeling like, like nothing else mattered. Like I remember thinking about all of the things that I've done in my life. And I'm like, I spent so much time focusing on things that I couldn't change. Right. And it's like, when I, when I look back up at my relationship with my brother, it's like, I would never, the only thing I would change is that I would tell him I love him more that I'm here for him. And it really started to get me to question of like, you know, I'm spending so much time and energy over here (laughs) trying to control this thing. And it's like, I I don't want to spend my life doing this. I don't want to spend my life being obsessed with my body. Now, at the same time, then I found wellness culture and I was like, see, but it's not a diet. (laughs) 
this is for health. And I learned to say all the right things. I learned the lingo. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to lose weight for, for aesthetics. I want to lose weight because it'll make me healthy. And so I remember being in therapy because uh, I decided to go for my master's in mental health and we were required to go for a program. And my therapist said to me, well, what, what does health mean? for you. And I I said something along the lines of like, well, I just want to not feel out of control with food or something like that. Or like, I want to be in control of food. I want to eat vegetables and I want to exercise. And so she said to me, so then you're already healthy. And I was like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Bazinga. I was, I was like, no, I also, I also need to be thin. And it was the first time anybody had ever questioned my thought or my thinking patterns of you are equating thinness to health. You think that in order to be healthy, you need to be thin. And I couldn't give her an, like an adequate reason why I'm like, that's just known information. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just fact. I know I'm going all over the place, but I promise it's, it, we're getting there. <laughs> So in my, my, uh, graduate program, I, I always say I found eating disorders on accident and I, cause I had an aunt who was an office manager at a well-known eating disorder recovery center. And they were like, Hey, we need someone to do an internship. And I was like, cool, I'll do an internship. And it was there that I started to realize this cognitive dissonance of, wow, the things that I did in my surgery, like weight loss surgery body is considered an eating disorder in somebody in a smaller body, right? So restricting your food, not being able to eat, being obsessed with your body. Like it was celebrated in my body, but it was looked at as a bad thing in someone in a smaller body. And so there were these cognitive dissonance, which for those who aren't familiar with that term as cognitive dissonance is when your beliefs and your thoughts don't match up. And I would be like, I would tell girls like, you can eat this food. It's okay. And meanwhile, I'm cutting it out because I'm following this wellness lifestyle plan. I was actively doing a wellness diet while I was at the eating disorder center. Nobody ever told me like, oh, you can't work here. (laughs) You know, it was like, okay, well, we just won't have you run meals. Or if you're going to run meals, you can't eat that way. Anyway, so I moved from that um, center. I went to three different locations and I had worked a lot of my body image. My body image still grieved me. Like it still was something that I'm like, I just don't see how I'm ever going to feel confident. Like, especially if the world sees this as something that I need to do better on. And the last location that I was at was like one of my last days. The dietitian there was like, Brie, I really think you would like this podcast. And would you know, <laughs> it was Food Psych by Christy Harrison. And when I heard your podcast, I, I say it was like, it was like a, a light switch. Like all of the, the pieces just kind of clicked together. And I had never, I just never had heard this before. And I was like, this is everything I have believed and, and thought in my soul that like, I am a good person. I don't need to qualify myself as a person that my, I don't owe anyone my health that I can live in a large body and be healthy. And yeah. So hearing, hearing your podcast was, was a game changer for me. Oh my God. I love that so much. I love that the podcast was so helpful to you in that moment. And it's so interesting, too, to me that, like, you spent all this time working at an eating disorder treatment center, not really getting exposed to the ideas of health at every size, right? It was only in this last day of, like, oh, by the way, check out this podcast that that came into your onto your radar. Yeah. And 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 now as somebody who has, you know, who works with people in, in eating disorder recovery, I don't think you can you can do eating disorder recovery without health at every size. I don't understand how it's not, it's not like a mainstream of like, like there should be lessons and classes and, you know, like it's, it's, it's just kind of crazy to me that it's not mainstream in recovery work. Yeah. It needs to be fully integrated into every form of treatment. I feel like that's, and you know, some treatment centers are starting to get that, I think, but it's not really, it's not as mainstream as I would have expected it to be given 
all of the science on health at every size that gets presented at eating disorder conferences every year. You know, like Absolutely. that's where I was first introduced to it was eating disorder conference. Well, first, first introduced was actually through a friend who's a journalist and had just happened to be really into health at every size. But professionally, the first time I was really introduced to it as a dietitian was these conferences. And it was like, you know, I came away from eating disorder conferences and trainings feeling like, okay, health at every size is best practices for treating eating disorders. And then going into treatment centers and seeing how different it was in practice was like a real cognitive dissonance for me. Cause I was like, wait, I thought this was what the science said. And then here's this treatment provider telling us that the person needs to lose weight or that like, why aren't they losing weight if they're not binging? They must be secretly, you know, engaging in behaviors or whatever it is. Which was basically my whole life, right? Is I would tell doctors, I don't binge eat and this is my body size. And it wasn't until I was later in life where they found some understandable medical reasons why my body might be larger, but also like, who cares <laughs> if all my numbers are good and I'm healthy? Why are you going to talk to me about health? And the reason was, is because they would be like, well, what about in the future? Right? Like it, that all, and so, and I still have this white coat syndrome where if a doctor tells me something, I'm like, I don't even know what to say back. Like if, you know, and nobody says it on the internet. I'm like, I can defend this, but a doctor says it. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm so, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's real trauma, right? The trauma of being subjected to medical oppression, to fat phobia at the hands of doctors. And doctors are these authority figures that are so revered in our society. Meanwhile, they're just people. They're just people with their own biases and, you know, really have no education in nutrition, no education in weight science or very little. There's, you know, they have the received wisdom that they've absorbed throughout their training, but they don't really ever get like true education in this stuff. And even the people who specialize, who go on to do continuing education in all of it, don't really get the full picture, I think. You know, they're they're basing a lot of their treatments and stuff on correlational evidence, not on, you know, they they think it's causation. They think it's larger body size causing these poor health outcomes, but they're not looking at all the confounding factors that go into that, like weight stigma and weight cycling and disordered eating and poverty and racism and other experiences of oppression. Like all of that stuff has so much more to do with health outcomes than what you eat and how you move your body. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and with the fact that you even said body trauma, right? So if we believe that the body keeps the score, right, that our body holds on to trauma, that the first painful memory I had with my weight and going to the doctors was eight. And then I carried that to like till being an adult that sometimes I still get anxious going to the doctor because the first time and then many times after that, when I've gone to the doctor and, and so like, I didn't know until hearing about health at every size that I could tell people, I don't want to be weighed. <laughs> that was such a liberating. I was like, what? And so I had actually, I found your podcast and I was working with a dietitian and I was, I was like, I don't want to go to my doctor's appointment because I'm afraid they're going to weigh me. And she's like, I'll call them. And I was like, you can do that. <laughs> She's like, yep, I'll call them and uh, they're not going to weigh you. And and so she said basically to them, unless it's medically necessary, please don't weigh her. It's been over two years. They haven't weighed me, meaning it hasn't been medically necessary to weigh me. Because it almost never is, right? There's really like, I can count on one hand the situations in which it might be medically necessary to weigh someone. Anesthesia. Yep chronic kidney disease or, you know, congestive heart failure or something where you might be retaining fluids and that could be a problem. Maybe pregnancy, but also there's ways to not weigh people in pregnancy if they so choose. Right. And, and then so even what you were talking about too, it's like I avoided going to the doctor's for years because I didn't want to be weighed. How many people might have active health issues that they are avoiding because of the fear of the treatment that they're going to get from the doctors? And that is so well documented, too, in the research, right, that people delay care or larger bodied people delay care because they are traumatized uh, from past experiences of weight stigma at the doctor's office and therefore, you know, don't end up getting care until diseases are more progressed, until their conditions are worse when they finally do come in the door. And, you know, that 
leads to oftentimes poor prognoses because they could have gotten intervention earlier. And then, of course, that poor prognosis gets blamed on the weight instead of being blamed on the weight stigma that caused it in the first place. Absolutely. So how did you, I'm curious to hear kind of like the personal and professional journey that you've you've been on since discovering health at every size in terms of coming into your work now with body image and you do a lot of work around like body grief and processing the trauma of weight stigma and I think it's interesting, you know, to dive into the talk about body image too from this perspective that like so many providers are often, and I know you and Fiona Sutherland and many of our other colleagues talk about this a lot, where there's sort of this passing of the buck, where it's like, no, the therapist's job is body image. No, it's going to be, you know, we're kicking it down the road. It has to be once the person's like recovered from behaviors and body image is like this hot potato that nobody wants to hold. And sometimes even in my work, like when I've thought of body image, I get this sort of blank feeling like, what even is it? You know, it just, it becomes this very like, stoner thoughts sometimes like what does body image even mean you know and I think it's it's very like even just the term I think is kind of opaque to a lot of people and I love how you break it down and just make it so much more easy to understand and like relevant so maybe we can start by just kind of defining what body image is and why you think it's so important to do this work concurrently with other recovery work yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, even my own body image work started before I knew health at every size. And I remember being in the recovery center and I was sitting, I, I was um, the intern and I was a per GM. So I, I ran all the groups and I remember sitting in a body image group and the material sucked. Like it was garbage. It was like, oh, if you don't like your body, say three nice things about it. And I'm thinking to myself, as a provider, I'm like, I wouldn't do this. Like, this is horrible. And I remember sitting in a group and one of the women said to me, she was like, Bray, you need to give me something tangible. Cause if you want to sell me on this body image stuff, like th this, this crap ain't going to fly. And she was, she was right. I was like, this is horrible. So I forced, it forced me to do my own research and to come up with my own stuff for body image. And, and so even then I, you know, touted myself as like a body image guru which fun fact almost became my, my Instagram page. I'm glad I didn't, I didn't go with that. <laughs> oh gosh, guru, such a, such a cringy title. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. And so I, I, you know, like I, I had done a lot of research on body image and I remember being in the eating disorder center and would talk to my supervisor about it. And the line that was touted was body image is the last step in recovery. And that was just a line that we would say, right? Like, okay, we're, we're going to just focus on weight restoration and food. Body image will come later. And that is an utter lie. Like if you are not actively working on your body image, you cannot actually, I don't believe, fully recover with your relationship with food because of how intertwined they are. So the, the definition that I use, I believe is from Netta, that body image is the way that we see ourselves in our mind or when we picture ourselves or when we see ourselves in pictures. It's the the, the way we view our body, very generic definition. But what I think people kind of conflate is this idea of body satisfaction and body image. Body image is how we see ourselves in our mind or in a picture, whereas body satisfaction is how we feel in our bodies, right? Is like, am I satisfied with like in my body? And more times than not, people say, no, right? I'm not satisfied. And so I, I use this unempirical scale that I started when I worked in the recovery center of, you know, okay, if, if negative 10 is I hate my body, zero is neutrality and positive 10 is I love my body. But just trying to figure out where do I fall on that scale? And a lot of times, you know, people will say that people have a really hard time saying that they hate their body, which is understandable. But I think neutrality is hard for people too. just being neutral towards your body. And so I even realized in my own journey with that, I was like, wow, like I don't even feel neutral towards my body. Like my body causes me a lot of shame. And so with this parallel of learning how to grieve the death of my brother, I have equated grief to how I, the relationship I've had with my body. So when I realized I am probably never going to be the size that I thought I was going to be in my head. I had to grieve that. I had to grieve the loss 
that came with that or the loss, the perceived loss that I think came with that. So I had to grieve the way that society would celebrate me. I had to grieve that I was never probably going to be the quote unquote after photo. I had to grieve that I was never going to make certain family members so proud of me because I never achieved that size. You know, when you look at the definition of grief and you break it down, grief means deep sorrow. And sorrow, when you break that definition down, you look it up, it literally means anything that can cause you distress, right? And my body caused me distress. And so I would say in my own journey with body grief and just allowing it to suck, not trying to change it, not trying to fix it, of just being like, this sucks. I actually had to learn how to connect to my body. And that's really hard, especially if you've experienced trauma. And I just want to tout that, like if anybody's experienced trauma, connecting to your body can be really hard. But in terms of like a body connection. So, and this is why I say that making peace with food is so intricately connected to your body image. How can you, how can you make peace with your body if you can't connect to your hunger and fullness? If you can't listen and have that curious dialogue of, Oh, I wonder what my body is trying to tell me. And so for me, intuitive eating was a way that I learned to connect to my body. And I realized how much shame and how many shame gremlins, as Brene Brown puts it, that I had in regards to food in my body that uh, I'll never forget the first time I ate a food that used to be off limits. And I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to plate it and I'm going to do, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do all my little, you know, disordered things. I, I didn't realize were so <laughs> disordered. And then I was like, I'm going to go back for more. And I was like, okay, we're going to, we're, you know, this is fine. This is a lot. And then I went back for more and then I went back for more and the shame I remember feeling it in my throat and just, it felt like this burning feeling and connecting to that. And I remember being like, this is not curiosity. This is judgment. But even in that being like, oh, like I can't even allow myself to experience this overeating experience without judgment. And so I can't figure out what's happening for me. And now what I, what what I had realized after that shame storm as Brene Brown calls it, which can we just say, I cannot wait for the day where she is health at every size. Like, oh, I know it's, it has to happen because we cannot have conversations about body image without talking about shame. Like it's just not possible. I know. I feel like she's like so close and yet so far away. So close. So close. It's going to happen. I believe it. Speak it into existence. So after that, that first shame storm, I looked back and I was like, you know what? I overate in that experience because I probably didn't eat enough earlier in the day. And I was like, man, if I could just get here (laughs) without the shame storm, this would be, this would be expedited so quickly. And so it was through a long process of challenging the shame storms, going through those moments. And I did it I did it alone. Like I did it. I had my therapist and I had, but like I would, I'd have these body image exposures and things that like I would challenge myself with. And I was like, man, I wish there was a position or something or someone who could help expedite this process for me. Enter Brie. (laughs) That I, I, I never want anyone to feel alone on this journey. And so this is why now I do body image coaching because I feel like, right. So you, you use this example of the hot potato and I feel like a lot of people don't want to touch body image because they probably haven't done it themselves and it is uncomfortable. And this is why I use the word grief because I, I, when you think about when somebody dies and you're just like, I don't even have words, like, I don't even know what to say. And this is awkward and uncomfortable, but I want to be there for them. That's how I show up for people with body image is I might not have the words. I'm not the expert in your body. I can't fix you. All I can do is show up for you. Yeah. And having someone show up for you in that way in this culture that makes body image such a shameful thing and makes having poor body image this thing that's supposedly fixed by weight loss advice and like showing up for them and not doing that, not giving that advice, but just sitting in the grief and sitting with it is so powerful and it's such a, like a different experience than most people get in our culture. Well, and I think that, you know, it's like, 
we want to fix it. When, when, when people feel uncomfortable, we want to fix the discomfort. But what I have found in my own experience, not just with body grief, but in real grief, the most helpful thing is just to sit in the discomfort. Don't fix it. Just be here with me. And I think also sometimes body image, they think it's like a checklist thing. But it's like, okay, check. Like intuitive eating, check. And I had a, I had a woman in my group. She said I could share. Um, I have a body grievers group. And she said to the group the other day, she was like, how long do I have to do this shit for? And I said, <laughs> for as long as you have a body, like your body is the longest relationship you're ever going to have. And it is diet culture to believe that at some point, you don't have to work on your relationship. It's like a relationship with your friends or your partner or your children. Like, okay, we, you know, we did one course and all of a sudden we're, <laughs> we never had conflict again. And that's, it's such a diet culture thing. And it's a lie that it can never deliver on. And I can, I can say from personal experience. So even now, and, and I'm big about normalizing body discomfort because I don't think we do that enough in our profession. I, uh, my body has, has gotten bigger and it's certainly made me uncomfortable, but what it hasn't done is it hasn't taken away my worth or value. Like I still believe that I am a valuable person, that I am worthy of love and respect, that my voice matters. And I think that because I've done a lot of work clinically in therapy through many years, of separating out my body image from my self-esteem and that, yeah, I am currently, I am uncomfortable with my body, but I'm not be uncomfortable because of my body. Like I am still me. I am. It's like a cup. The cup size has changed, but the content inside hasn't. That's so interesting. And I, I love that distinction between like, I'm un uncomfortable with my body, but I'm not uncomfortable because of my body, because I think that's the line in diet culture, right? That if you gain weight and you're uncomfortable, that it must be physical discomfort caused by the weight and that the only solution is to lose the weight rather than like teasing apart what is emotional discomfort with weight gain and what is maybe some physical discomfort that's just the reality of living in a larger body, but that can be addressed not through weight loss, but through other means of taking care of yourself and just, you know, new self-care behaviors. But like, you know, nobody like in mainstream diet culture, people aren't doing that work of like separating those things out. People are just saying, I'm uncomfortable because of my body. Let me lose weight to fix it. Or losing weight is the only way to fix it. Even if I want to be anti-diet, even if I want to be fat positive, mm -hmm. I just can't accept this discomfort of living in a larger body. So the only way to get, you know, to escape it is weight loss. Even that word escape, right? It's like, it's our bodies become a scapegoat. It's really easy to just blame our bodies. And I'll use this example a lot with clients. And I actually think I probably heard it on your podcast. And it was the first time I thought about it, I was like, huh. So I'm very short. And sometimes when I go to the grocery store, I can't reach things on the top shelf. It's uncomfortable. It is annoying. But I don't think of myself as less of a person because I can't reach something on the top shelf and I need an accommodation to reach something on the top shelf. Yet we do that with our bodies, right? You know, I ranted about this yesterday that the reason that we feel like a failure when we gain weight is because that is the message society sends that, and, and, and maybe, maybe they don't send the message that we're a failure, but they do send the message that weight loss equals success. So what would the opposite be? And if you're gaining weight, of course, the message is that you've somehow failed. But that's not true. That's not true. And we know that that's not true, even if it doesn't feel true. And that's that's also the difference, too, of when we have feelings. And I'm a big person in, in making space for our feelings and, and being honest about your experience. But if you're scapegoating your body of like, so if somebody says to me, Brie, I am uncomfortable with you know, my body, if I could just be able to tie my shoes or if I could just keep up with my kids, I know that I feel, I just feel more comfortable in my body. And I, again, heard this on your podcast of what would advice be that you would give to someone in a smaller body? If your advice wouldn't be, well, okay, well, let's just lose a little weight because then, then, and this is what happens, right? Is people think I'm going to lose the, I'm going to lose weight and then I'm going to feel comfortable in my body. No, what's going to happen is then you're going to find other things that you want to fix 
right? And then again, we go back to the body. But here's the other thing is then you live in constant fear of, oh no, what happens when my body changes? And that's not body love. And I also want to say too, not everybody's journey is going to be body love, right? And I think body positivity um, has been really, I don't know. Co-opted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like it's not just about like, woohoo, like I love my body. Like love, your definition of love changes when you realize that it's not conditional. Could you imagine saying to your to your husband, I will love you when you do all of the things that I want you to do? <laughs> <laughs> like I just even imagine like you would never say that. Never. It would be horrible. It would but that's not love, right? Like that's what is that? That's control. And I think that that's another thing is people are searching for control. They feel if we try to access those core beliefs, right? People feel out of control. And what happens when we try to get control, right? It's a defense mechanism. And so I don't judge you for trying to feel in control. But what I have found in my experience is that the more peace that I have, the less control I need. That's so interesting. So that changes the dynamic then, right? Of like, if you're feeling uncomfortable with your body or in your body and not needing to control it, you're not, you're not having to, you know, you're not feeling this pressure to lose weight. You're not feeling this cognitive dissonance of, you know, I'm trying to accept my body, but I also want to lose weight. It's, it's much more, much more peaceful. It's, it's like, it's like riding a wave. Right. So I'll I'll even explain. So I noticed my body changing and it made me really uncomfortable. So the first question I asked myself was, what is the worst part about this? Like, what is the story that I'm telling myself? And so the story that I was telling myself is that I feel like I failed. And I said, okay, well, I know I don't believe that. So why am I, why is that the message that I'm believing? And so I started thinking about, you know, especially, you know, being in the times that we're in, um, being in quarantine seeing a lot of fat phobic memes, seeing a lot of people make weight loss jokes or make weight gain jokes or self-control jokes. It plays into it. Seeing the obsession with uh, celebrities losing weight and as if somehow that like makes them a better artist. Like I really don't understand truly, but right. So there is this societal um, consumption with with body size. And then there is this normalcy for myself of like, in this non-judgment of like, you know, I, I'm sitting at a table under my stairs doing my sessions all day. Like I'm sitting a lot more than I normally would. So my body is hurting and, and I can make space for the discomfort without also trying to just fix the feeling. And so even last night I was like, okay, How can I love my body tonight? And I was like, I need to stretch. And that's a form of movement, right? Which in any dieting day, that would not be considered movement. That would be considered rest day. (laughs) Just like, I just need, you know, I feel tension in my body and I think this is going to help me to relax and to sleep. And, and then also sharing it, sharing with, you know, I say with my friends on Instagram, it, it kind of took some of the shame out of it. And I was like, okay, like, I've shared it and now I'm going to, I'm going to move on and I cannot control my body size. And that's the other thing too, is I think when we, when we, when we go down this rabbit hole of thinking I can control it or it worked for that person, it does give us this euphoric high of maybe this time, but you and I know the research and the science doesn't really add up. (laughs) And so how do I want to spend my time? How do I want to spend my effort? And I I said this to a client the other day who's really struggling with the eating disorder. And I said, when you're obsessed with your body, all of your energy goes to that. So you can spend your life trying to perfect your body. That is your choice. You have the right to body autonomy. Like if you want to pursue weight loss, that is your choice. That is your right. But I imagine that you want such a full life and you want so many more things for your life and there isn't enough room in the cup for you to be obsessed with your body and have a big full life and i think that the fear comes and i know this was my fear was that what if i'm not accepted because of my body like what i'm going to get found out 
Like people are going to look at me and be like, you have no right to talk about body image because you're in a large body. (laughs) And now that I'm here, I can tell you that it's the opposite, that because I'm in a large body, people are like, you get it. Wow. I feel seen. And that, that to me, it just, it's so meaningful. That's amazing. I mean, there's so much in what you just said, too. I think that's so important to dive into all this because one thing that's really struck me in contemplating body image from a much more health at every size, fat positive, anti-diet perspective is that what typically gets sold as body image work in like mainstream eating disorder treatment is not even scratching the surface and that what it really is about. And I think you've said this, I've heard you say this in talks you've given is like that body image work has a lot to do with internalized fat phobia, right? And that that it's about unearthing that internalized weight stigma. And that's a that's a key part of body image work that gets left out. And, you know, for you as someone in a large body and who is doing this work and like all of us has the sort of unfolding journey of your body image through time and your relationship with your body in this global pandemic and taking in all the stuff that's coming in from outside that is triggering, really triggering to a lot of people. Right. You know, you're going to have that ebb and flow and some of those fat phobic thoughts may be coming back up. But the way that you've learned to work with them, I think is really helpful and that, that other people can take a lot from too, that you're like, not just, you know, feeling like, oh God, my body's bad. My body's larger. I need to change it. And jumping immediately to like, how can I lose weight? But look, you know, getting underneath it, like, why is my body, why is my relationship with my body more difficult right now? Why am I feeling more uncomfortable in my body right now? Oh, it's because of all these external inputs that are coming in. And I have felt it too, you know, myself as someone in a smaller body, yeah. who's never experienced external fat phobia, but certainly has had my share of internalized fat phobia from this culture. You know, the the stuff that's happening in the world right now, just the anxiety of living through a pandemic in general, but also like the quarantine, whatever, you know, memes and the fears about weight gain and the stuff about Adele's weight loss and all of it, right? Like it's it's definitely heightened my anxiety. And I've noticed too an uptick in some negative body image thoughts that when I really step back and say like, what is this really about? It's not about my body size itself. It's about how I'm feeling about my body based on these influences outside of me and these and these inner influences too of like what's going on in my inner emotional life that is getting projected onto my body because that's such a default in our culture. Yeah. And I just wanted to comment too, like, and I I know I'd said this to you before, but like, I work with so many professionals who are in a smaller body and they, they feel like, I know that I have this internalized fat phobia and I've really worked on it. And, and then I get like really defensive of people and I'm like, yeah, like that's awesome. Um, But I know that there's still insecurity of like, can I be talking about this because I'm in a thin body? And what I'm going to say to you is you're, you're never going to make everybody happy (laughs) no matter what you do. But I, I know for me, I had such internalized fat phobia as a large bodied woman that if I did not hear it from someone like you, Christy, who literally has nothing to gain by sharing this message, like, like I had such internalized fat phobia because I actually had seen, I had also heard of you through Jess Baker and I'd followed her work and I loved Jess. I love her so much. And there was still this like twinge of like, but is she just justifying her body size? Right. That was how deep entrenched in my own fat phobia I was. So that yeah, I needed I needed someone like you to share this message and to just normalize my experience and be like, yeah. And I'll never forget the first episode I ever listened to on the podcast was Judith Matt's uh, Emotional Eating. And I remember I was listening at one point thinking like, here they go, they're going to say something. And then it was like a totally different of like, like emotional eating isn't that. And I was like, oh, I've never heard this before. <laughs> And just feeling so seen and so heard. And and so all that to say of like not being ashamed of what you didn't know. We are all learning. We're all growing. But that, yeah. So, I mean, mostly just thank you for the work that you do and the message that you put out there. Because it helped me. It helped me have a bigger life. I so appreciate that. I'm so glad that my message has resonated with you and the message of health at every size 
got to you and helped you do the work that you're doing now. Like it's, it's incredible. And I really came to this work through my own personal journey too, of like having my own experiences of poor body image and internalized fat phobia driving me toward disordered behaviors right. and really s- unfolded so organically. Like I think about when you say like you literally have nothing to gain from this. I'm like, yeah, that is absolutely true. And funnily enough, some of the the criticism that I've heard online is like, oh, she's just out to make a buck. She's she's clearly not trying to justify her body size. So her only other motive could be money. And let me just say that like I could make so much more money. I would be I would be so much closer to paying off my massive student loan debt and like having my shit together financially if I just sold weight loss. Like that's just the reality, you know, not that you can't make a living as an anti-diet dietitian and I'm doing just fine now after, you know, nine years of working in the nutrition field and 17 plus years as a journalist, like I'm, I'm finally doing okay. But, you know, it's taken a long time to get here and like the, it's much more lucrative on the diet culture side. I will say that. So really you have to want to do this work. Like you have to want to do this work as a social justice mission, as a, you know, personal crusade against diet culture in order to, to like stick with it because it's, it's harder, you know? And I mean, it's, it's hard for someone in a smaller body who's a dietitian with all this privilege that I have, like the, you know, educational privilege and experience that I bring into it, but also like white privilege and cisgender privilege and all the stuff that makes my path easier. And so I can't imagine, like, I mean, I can imagine, but I, you know, I haven't lived it. This, the obstacles that people in larger bodies doing this work are up against, the obstacles that people in other marginalized identities are up against when they come to do this work. Like it is real. The obstacles are very real. And so, you know, to all of us doing this work, I kind of just want to say thank you. Like, thank you, Brie, for your work in body image and like the work that you're doing to help people heal their relationship with their bodies. And I know that you experience a lot of pushback from the diet culture side in doing this work. And you have to like walk through the fire every day to do your work. And I so appreciate that you're doing that. And to everyone else who's doing it, I so appreciate that work. Well, I I mean, I appreciate that so much. And I think about where I was in diet culture and that was so much harder than pushing a get back against diet culture. Like, it's like, once you know, and you're like, yeah, like this just, it resonated with my soul. I was like, this is it. Like, you got me. I'm here. I'm ready to fight. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, I just, I, I know this is right. And uh, I, I always say our message is not for everybody. Not everybody's going to be aligned with it. And that's their choice. I always tell my clients, if you want to lose weight, you have the right to body autonomy. But at the end of the day, I cannot co-sign that because I know the harmful impacts that come with weight stigma, with fat phobia, and with weight cycling. And so, yeah, my hardest day in in being in diet culture uh, is not as hard as the pushback that I get standing up against it. How do you navigate that? Like, what are some ways that you bolster yourself and take care of yourself through that? So for me, I I always come back to my why, right? Of why am I doing this? And so, um, you know, like if I get pushed back that like, you're just doing this to justify your body. Like, okay, like that's fine. People are entitled to, to believe what they want to. But I, I come back to my why of wanting to help the most people in the best possible way, right? And and I think about where I was and even well, like in my most disordered day, though I never had an eating disorder, I definitely struggled with body dysmorphia. And the assuredness I feel now in myself doesn't come because of how my body looks. It be- comes from who I know that I am. And so I think for myself, checking in with my self-talk is really important. It's one of the biggest lessons that I teach my clients. And so how I do that is I identify or I personify my gremlin as shame, right? It's a person. It is a he. He's annoying. He's rude. He tries to, like, he is that, like, imposter syndrome that comes up. And it's like, you don't know what you're talking about. They're not going to take you seriously. 
you know, all, all of those things and personifying it as someone that's not me and really trying to connect with my loving inner parent of how would I speak to a loved one? What would I say to someone I care about? And speaking to myself that way, that has transformed everything in my life of just being kinder to myself. And I, I know it's like, I, I imagine if I was listening to this, I'm like, oh, I know myself talk, blah, blah, blah. No, it's so important because you cannot play two tracks at once. You cannot play a, a track of shame and belittling and a soundtrack of love and encouragement. And, you know, shame can be a powerful motivator, but a far more powerful motivator is encouragement. So much more. Oh, so much more effective <laughs> and better long-term results and better mental health. So I would say that I'd say having a strong community of people. I mean, and, and it's one of the best things. Yes. Does the internet come with a lot of trolls? Sure. But it's also given me the opportunity to connect to some amazing people whom I never would have connected with before. So finding a community of people who are aligned with this message that has helped me too. Oh, it's so important. I That's one of the things, too, for me that keeps me going is just knowing that this community is here and behind me and that I have my friends and allies and colleagues, you know, that are that are supporting me and doing this work. Absolutely. And, and it's funny because so I was talking about like creating my page. I never created my page to be anything like I didn't imagine becoming a body image coach. Like I literally only created my page because I was like, you know what? I don't see a lot of fat therapists on here talking about this. And I don't want all of my friends to hate me for talking about body image all the time. So I'm like, I'll just make another page. I never imagined it would become what it's become. But it's it's been such a great source of, yeah, of just community that I I will I will forever be thankful for. And even the fact that I got to meet you, I mean, I, I don't know if you remember, I like fangirled so hard and you were like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. No, it's so great to meet you in person. And I just, I love connecting with people that my work has touched or that this health at every size and anti-diet work brings together. It's the best. It's powerful. Absolutely. It's so powerful. And it makes me so grateful for the internet too, because there are those days certainly when I want to just like <laughs> chuck my computer out the window and never go online again, <laughs> you know, but but I think that the connections with real people all across the world that are doing this work and that are aligned with this mission where it's not about making money, it's not about justifying anyone's body size, it's not about, you know, competition or anything like that. It's actually just supporting one another in healing our relationships with our bodies and healing, helping other people heal their relationships with their bodies and with food and you know, ridding the world of this social injustice that is fat phobia. That is my why. That's what keeps me going. Amen. So powerful. Oh, God. I love it. I could talk with you forever and we need to do this more offline very soon once we can, you know, see each other in person again. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Oh. Absolutely. One day. But in the meantime, let us know where people can find you online and learn more about your work. Absolutely. So I would say the best way to find me is probably just on Instagram, uh, body image with Brie, or you can email me body image with Brie at gmail.com. I'm in process of, of updating my website and it's a mess. So don't go there, <laughs> <laughs> but I offer body image coaching. And I would say like, how do you know if coaching is right for you? Because of, you know, state lines, I can't, I can't do counseling um, unless you're in the state of New Jersey, but I've really actually sort of moved away from counseling and really want to move towards coaching on this online presence because I want to help expedite this body image process for you. And I have a, you know, a number of different packages that I offer, depending on when this airs, I might have a couple of groups going or a group going. I also am going to be starting a, a peer fat supervision. And so if you are a professional in the field and you are just feeling like I can't like I have, you know, a lot of larger bodied clients and I'm really struggling. I want to offer that support because I do think that I have that lived experience. And then I also have clinical experience that might be able to help you. So I'll definitely be 
um, offering that. And then, you know, I, I've had the wonderful opportunity of um, speaking on a number of different podcasts and uh, different, you know, workshops. And so, um, yeah, if you come on my page, you'll, you'll definitely be able to find all of that there. Oh, I love it. We'll put links to that in the show notes. So people can find you. And I definitely encourage everyone to follow your Instagram. It's really helpful and so healing just for anyone who's working through body image issues, which in this culture, we really all are. Thank you so much, Christy. This has been such an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Brianna Campos for joining us on this episode and to Savala Trepchinsky for her great answer on Ask Food Psych and to you for listening. If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please help us reach more people who need to hear the anti-diet message because who doesn't by sharing this episode and subscribing to the pod on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform, whatever that may be. You can see all the places to subscribe and share at christyharrison.com slash subscribe. That's christyharrison.com slash subscribe. You can also leave us a nice rating and review in your podcast provider of choice, which is another way to help new listeners find us and is always very much appreciated. If you're looking for some practical tips to help you get started on the anti-diet path, grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, just go to christyharrison.com slash 250. That's christyharrison.com slash 250. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. This episode was brought to you by ThreadUp. Saving on your closet just got a lot easier and more fun with ThreadUp. Get an exclusive offer of an extra 30% off your first order when you go to threadup.com slash foodpsych. That's T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H for 30% off your first order today. Terms apply. A big thanks, as always, to our editor and sound engineer, Mike Lalonde, our community and content associate, Vinci Chue, our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasik, and our transcriptionist, Mycroft Holmes, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Melissa Alam. Our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. And I'm your host and producer, Christy Harrison. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay psyched. Stay psyched.